Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we discuss all things Beatles. It could be anything that's a part of the Beatles history. It could be things that are going on today. Um, I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, also known for my other Beatles program syndicated called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts. We've got the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And two writers for Beatle Fan Magazine. We have Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we've also got Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everybody. This time out, I thought that we would talk about uh, something that's been in the news of late, and it's gotten quite a lot of attention, and that is the new collaboration between Paul McCartney and Kanye West. And there has been quite a lot going on on the Internet, and I'm sure everybody has seen uh, what's been posted in the last couple of weeks about the big controversy over this this new collaboration. And uh, some of Kanye's fans have gone on Twitter and have asked the question of who this Paul McCartney guy is. And it raises a whole bunch of questions, not only about the collaboration and about the song, but uh, the differences of generations and whether or not the young people of today are familiar with who Paul McCartney is, whether or not they know his music. And also, as I've read a whole bunch of articles about this, some people have written that young people shouldn't have to know the music of people from who have had careers of 50 years, who have been around that long. So, you know, just this whole thing has opened up to a lot of areas of discussion here. And I find it all very fascinating. I've, I've read a whole bunch of stuff online. I like to read what fans have to say, especially on Facebook, although sometimes it can get pretty frustrating at times. <laughs> but um, oh, really? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, first of all, before we get into the controversy of this whole collaboration, your take on what you think of this new song. It's called Only One. And the thing is that despite the fact that Kanye is known for being a hip-hop artist, this is really a ballad it wasn't what i expected yeah. to hear it's really just a mm -hmm. sweet love song and paul plays the keyboards on it and kanye does all the singing if you call it singing because he's using auto-tune and i remember hearing in the very beginning that paul was supposed to be doing background vocals on this but if 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 you weren't told that you wouldn't know it it's not like it, you can pick him out singing background on here but i wanted to get your take each of the three of you on what you thought of the song and the recording. Why don't we start, first of all, with how about you, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a perfectly okay song. As you say, it isn't what you expect from Kanye, who's, uh, who's more of a, a, a rap or hip-hop artist. Um, I thought it was a, a fairly pretty ballad, and it had... Um, you know, it was even sentimental in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to judge him on the auto tune because these days pretty much everybody uses auto tune. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, and and I and I I don't know I don't know if I have any way of being sure whether he did or didn't. But it, it, in a way, it doesn't matter to me because I, I don't really spend a lot of time listening to Kanye West. I've you know I've listened to mm -hmm. some of his music. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that so many people, including Paul, regard him as uh, the great genius of contemporary pop. I'm not saying you know he is or he isn't. It, it just seems like to me, to me, it, he seems a little commonplace. But um, you know, it, it just. Um, there has to be some reason that all of these people uh, of usually great discernment are, are focusing on his music and on him. And um, I'd love to know what it is. And I, I'm actually going to spend some more time listening to more of his stuff to try and see if I can determine it. But the song mm. itself, you know, it was a nice song. As you say, uh, if you didn't know Paul was playing the piano on it, you wouldn't know Paul was even on it. And the piano part, I, I didn't really think was much, to tell you the truth. Uh, it, it's just you're just sort of courting along while Kanye's singing. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, from what I've read, um, that the whole thing about Kanye's fans not, you know, wondering who Paul McCartney is was kind of a hoax. I, I, I didn't think that was real. Do, do we have any definitive sense of whether that's the case? 
I've seen articles that say that a lot of it was was just a lot of people joking around, and I that's kind of what I believe. I don't some and I read somewhere and I can't remember where that somebody said that a lot of them do know who Paul McCartney is. That it, it you know the, the ignorance that was reflected in those posts was not really correct. It was not really the way things really were. So. I think what also made it clear that it was a joke was all of this talk of, you know, like, wow, this McCartney guy's really going to make it now that he's done this, because there's nothing Paul McCartney-ish about. There's nothing that you could even identify as him, you know? So, and, mm. and if it was an anonymous pianist playing it, nobody would say, be saying, wow, whoever that pianist is is now really going to have a big career. You know, so that struck me as part of the jokiness of the, of the whole episode, you know? I, I think it was, I really do think it was a joke because it kind of doesn't make sense as reality. <laughs> part of the fascination for me in this song is the fact that even though Paul is listed as a songwriter... And you'd have to think that, that Kanye wrote the words. There are four songwriters listed on the song. So you have to pretty much guess that Paul had something to do with the melody, but it doesn't sound anything like a McCartney melody to me. So it, it really sounds like something different. You know, it, it just, yeah. um, you know, when, when you hear Paul working with other artists, there's something always that is McCartney-esque in everything that he does. And even when, when he's entering a different genre like classical music, even though he did classical stuff in the Beatles, but his own classical works have the hallmarks of McCartney melodies to them. There's still something about them that, that makes you think this is Paul. Right. I just don't hear that in this song, but I still like the song a lot. I would like this song even if Paul McCartney wasn't on it. It does kind of make you wonder, though. I mean, if you think about the Beatles catalog and how brilliant those songs were, and we know that there are two songwriters listed for most of them, apart from George's and Ringo's, um, and that even at that, that was just because John and Paul had a deal that they would both be listed, but it really was one songwriter writing these incredible songs. Why should this song have taken four people? <laughs> <laughs> Well, these, I don't know. these I don't days, know. these days, that that happens a lot because uh, the way it seems the way uh, pop and hip hop records are crafted these days, it seems that uh, almost anybody that uh, contributes anything gets a songwriting credit. You know, mm. if you notice most of, uh, say, you know, Beyonce's hits or, uh, you know, or Jay-Z or, you know, or Kanye, you know, look at the number of songwriters that are credited to most of the songs. And, uh, you know, so it's it's possible that the <laughs> the concept of songwriting is being really stretched. Hmm. You think it's a throwback to the 50s when, you know, DJs who were plugging the song would be getting, uh, you know, a writer credit as a kind of form of payola in a way. I mm -hmm. suppose that's a possibility, too. I mean, that, well, happens, that's, that happens. That's not just hip hop. That's happening all over the place. Hmm. But, well, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, one of the songwriters listed is Kanye's mother. And the whole idea behind the song is that it's supposed to be a message of Kanye's mom who passed away wanting to communicate with Kanye's daughter. So I mm. guess Kanye was being generous in enlisting her as, as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so what did you think of the song, Al? Uh, it's, it, there's a certain, uh, uh, because of you know, the subject matter that you just mentioned, there's a certain poignance to it. Especially when you consider the fact that both Kanye and Paul lost their mothers at a you know relatively early age, uh, may, which and that may be one of the things that brought the two of them together. In fact, our uh, recent guest Candy Leonard uh, wrote a piece that appeared in I think the Huffington Post late late last week, in which she made five points about similar what she felt were similarities between. Paul and Kanye, you know, mm. some, some musical, some not, not so musical. It's, it's interesting. Cause I, I, uh, just before uh, we came on, I, I listened to, um, uh, the basic track, the main track, but there are also a couple of other remixes, uh, that are much, much denser instrumentally. 
There's one that has mm. a saxophone and, and uh, you know, a full band behind them. Uh, another another one that's very percussion driven. But, the you know, the, I guess the the standard version seems to be the one with just the, you know, electric piano backing. And it's, um, you know, it's uh, as I said, there's a certain points to it. The, there is a you know, it, it is a nice melody, which, you know, you don't really associate particularly nice melodies with hip hop music, but it's, um, it, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly accessible. And, and as I said, there's a certain poignance and I'm, I'm still <laughs> clutching to the, uh, uh, the idea that all of those, uh, you know, who is this guy, Paul McCartney tweets a couple of weeks ago were, uh, people from camp Kanye, uh, kind of using irony to promote the record, at least at least I would I would hope so. Hmm. How about you? Could Steve? have been people from Cam McCartney too, though. Well, that's pos- <laughs> That's very possible too. Yeah. Yeah. I I I have to say I thought the song was pretty inconsequential. I was not taken very much by it. I have to I I do have to say I was surprised that it was as mellow as it was. I really didn't expect that from Kanye West. Um, but. Uh, you know, and the fact that McCartney can barely be heard on it, you know, really kind of uh, didn't make it much to, you know, give it much uh, significance to me. You know, I mean, he, yeah, he's there, but you barely can hear him. And I mean, I mean, I will say it's a, it is a tender song, but for you know anyone who doesn't really care about uh, Kanye West, I don't see any reason to be all that curious about it except for the fact that paul mccartney's in the background that's mm. uh, i mean i i'm and all this and all the talk about the you know who is paul mccartney again con, you know internet controversies come and go all the time um and it doesn't take uh much to get one started and whoever was responsible for that who is paul mccartney think whether it be kind of the kanye west people which Okay, I, I kind of think that's probably where it came from, or you know, Kanye West fans, or uh, I really doubt Paul McCartney fans said anything like that. But you know, those kind of uh, internet controversies come and go all the time. I mean, there's almost a new one every day, and uh, you know, I just didn't see any. You know, I mean, I I kind of laughed at the the who was Paul McCartney thing, and then when I saw that a lot of a lot of Kanye fans knew who he was. You know, it just kind of, you know, it's just kind of another one of those 20 million a day things like the latest Sarah Palin speech or something, you know, that, <laughs> that gets that, that gets picked up and people go crazy and, and you know, and laugh and everything. It's, you know, that's, it, I think it was, that was really insignificant. But other, but the song itself, I don't think it's going to be something we're going to be talking about further down the line, unless, as I said to Candy Leonard and I were discussing this on Facebook yesterday. Unless there's a continuation of this partnership, if this is the only song they ever do, it's going to die and nobody's going to care anything about this. But if they decide to continue as has been suggested that they will, well, that will be interesting. And it will be also interesting to see what the follow-up song is like, especially from McCartney's point of view and his contribution. So hmm. I think typically when he's done these collaborations that have been a little lasting, like with Elvis Costello and with Michael Jackson and mm-hmm. uh, even Eric, Eric Stewart. Well, with Eric Stewart was more like uh, someone contributing to his songs. Um, but with the others, it's been more like, uh, you know, one song will come out and will be mainly one of the collaborators and the other one, the next one will be McCartney or, you know, it will go back and forth. I mean, with the Elvis Costello one, there were a few songs that ended up on um, uh, Mighty Like a Rose, Elvis's album, and a few that ended up on Flowers in the Dirt. And uh, so... If this is an ongoing collaboration, I would expect possibly the next one to be more McCartney centric. Uh, And that might actually be interesting because I'd be curious about what Kanye West's contribution to that would be and what Kanye West's influence on that would be. Because uh, Paul, when he does these collaborations, 
does actually seem to take in the influence of whoever he's collaborating with and have some middle ground going. So that could be, mm. you know, interesting in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, that is a good point. Uh, to counter what you were saying, Steve, it's very hard to judge when a song comes out what kind of shelf life it's going to have or whether or not it's going to be significant a year from now, five years from now, or ten years from now. You know, I still love the collaborations that Paul did with Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder. Those are records that you never hear played on the radio anymore. And I still think they're great recordings. So, you know, it's, it's tough to say when you hear a song what the, what the future holds for it. You know, what, okay. ki what kind of uh, is going to have any durability at all. And that's not to say that years from now that those records with Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson they might get played again. And it might be held in high regard. So it's difficult to say with anything, especially when you first when you're first hearing a record. Um, so, but I I admire the fact that Paul tries to collaborate. He's always looking for inspiration somewhere. Um, you know, he's collaborated with a lot of people in his solo career now, and um, I think it surprises a lot of people when Paul has said that he's a Kanye fan. It may not be, you know, the genre of music that his fans have grown up to love. It's not they most of his fans do not embrace rap music or, or, or hip hop. The the older fans, that mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So I just think that it's it's um, you know, every artist needs inspiration. So wherever he can get it from, if he sees something in Kanye's music that that inspires him in some way. And sometimes artists look for anything in music. I, I, I like to bring up, I may, I may have said it a few times on this show, if you watch the Something New documentary on Paul, for the song Appreciate, he, he, was, he was hearing a song that Usher had recorded. And all that he was referring to was a certain sound that he was looking for. So how, whatever inspires you, whether it's a lyric or a melody or a production or a musicianship in some way, wherever it comes from, all that is important. And I'm not saying Paul listens to all of today's music. He listens to some. And from previous interviews that he's given, a lot of it comes from his kids and who his kids listen to. Right. Some of the music that he Paul, listens to today are, are from that, too. So, plus, um, Paul, plus you know, Paul has a history of, of being very, very fond of, of R&B and reggae and really of black music in general uh-huh mm -hmm. you know this goes all the way back to you know to the beetle days so yeah. uh so it's it's not really surprising that he's that he's very receptive to usher uh particularly somebody like usher who's pretty much who's more of a you know an r&b balladeer than a you mm -hmm. know than a hip-hop artist um and uh you know and probably kanye as well you know, I mean, think of how how much of a fan he was of Stevie Wonder before they ever worked together. Right. Oh, he loves Stevie. The Absolutely. two of them have such mutual respect for each other. But I think I'd like to bring up the fact that, as you had just indicated in your article, Steve, on, on uh, Beatles Examiner, the success of this song so far. I mean, this song is now the number one R&B uh, digital download on Billboard, and also uh, it's there's an uh, this is a different chart R and B in hip hop. It's number one. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it also debuted on the Billboard Hot 100 at number 35, and that makes it. Let's let's try some trivia here. <laughs> let's see how you guys figure with this trivia. This is Paul's first top 40 single since what song? Well, I, I know the answer, but uh, so <laughs> I'll let Alan take, take a crack. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I'll. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I'm amazed. <laughs> oh, <kidding>. come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm just messing it out. Uh, I really don't know. Um, it's the but, last uh, time he. Oh, go you ahead. Want to say it? It's I'm my great face. Yeah. yeah, I was just, I was just going to say that. I yeah. Believe I, I really was. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know my great face that that was 1989 that's how long it's been since paul had a, a top 40 single mm -hmm. so that's actually the answer way, my great face yeah in some mm -hmm. ways you know i i'm thrilled that this is in the top 40 but at the same time i'm deploring the fact that all the the really strong singles that he's had since my brave face wasn't given the airplay that it deserved 
you know. I mean, starting with this like, one like, right after My Brave Face was was an incredible song. You would have thought that would have done at least as well as My Brave Face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a great pop Th- this record. One I, meaning, I always, yeah, yeah, and the world tonight mainly. I, I thought that that was going to be a hit. I was so sure that was going to be a big comeback hit for him, and it barely got airplay on the radio. So, but um, it's pretty amazing to think that here's a song that Paul's a part of, and it's number one on digital downloads in the R&B category. And you could say that it's because of Kanye, but still, I was, yeah, I was he's a say. part of it. Mm-hmm. But still, he's a part of it. The same way that he was a part of the other collaborations, although they were more equal collaborations, the Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson right, collaboration. Right. So so let's let's talk a little bit more about that controversy on Twitter, the fact that some of the, the fans, Kanye's fans, apparently, have said that, you know, who is this Paul McCartney guy? If you remember a couple of, a couple of years ago, um, I believe it was after Paul appeared on the Gra- on a Grammy Awards show. I forget which year. It was within the last three or four years, I'd say. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't last year. It wasn't the big one last year. But it was a relatively recent Grammy Award appearance. And there were there were tweets almost immediately after the show or even after his appearance from, you know, obviously younger people uh, who are, you know, obviously the core of, uh, you know, the, the Twitter followers out there, you know, basically asking, who is this old guy, Paul McCartney? Mm. And I, I'm sure to those of us who grew up with him, this is shocking. That yeah. Anybody could even express that. But, yeah. you know, I, but uh, but I think it's it's kind of reflection uh, a, a reflection of how fragmented the music of of today is, you mm-hmm. know, because there are there are people that, you know, there are young people who, you know, basically all if they if all they listen to is hip hop, you know, hip hop radio stations and all their all they hear is that music and they're not at all interested in the history of, of pop music at all. all. All they're concerned with is what's out now and what's what hip hop songs are hot. It's not surprising that they don't know who Paul McCartney is because that's just, it's just the way it is. It's not like it used to be where you would have radio stations that played everything that played just Mm -hmm. whatever was popular, which is, you know, basically what we all grew up listening to, you know, stations like WABC in New York, you know, that played basically as long as it was popular, they played it, you know, and that, that, that type of radio doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, if, you, if you go back to if you go back to the sixties and seventies, listening to top forty, w- where they played so many different genres of music, you would hear pop, you would hear Motown, you'd hear R and B, you'd hear mm-hmm. country music, you mm-hmm. would hear Frank Sinatra being played. Strangers exactly. in the Night in the sixties, yes. you know, at the time, what was he in his forties or fifties? But he 50s. was an older person, and he he was still being played to young people. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, contrast today you know everything is as you said fragmented and everything has a specific demographic a specific audience that everything is being targeted to and um you know for that right. reason that you just people expect the music that's out today to only only to be targeted and to appeal to young people mm-hmm. and um that's 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 really sad you know, but yeah. I, I question sometimes, and I don't know if we're going off topic here, but when I grew up as a little kid in the 60s and 70s, I was exposed to so many different types of music through Top 40, through the Beatles themselves. You know, I listened to everything, show music, sure. classical music. I listened to Herb Albert, who was a big part of my life in the 60s. Sure. And my parents played for me Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and the great crooners and Bing Crosby and people like that and big band music. And they would say to me, that's my generation. And I would say, well, I like it too. (laughs) Why Mm -hmm. can't that be my generation? But, you know, people who grew up at a certain time, the teenage years, their early years, maybe their 20s, that's the music. People associate the music of their life with the music of their youth. And I think Mm -hmm. we're brought up in a culture that way. 
And oh, absolutely. We've all experienced, all four of us, I remember a few months ago, for some reason I was having a conversation with someone who didn't know who Linda Ronstadt was. Yeah. And I'm like in shock, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's because her music is not being targeted to her. It's not being programmed to her kind of audience. And she's right. more into R&D. And, you know, that's all that it is. It's all about exposure. And, you know, for instance, if you, you know, even of what passes for what the, what would be top 40 radio now, what they call CHR, Contemporary Hits Radio, uh, right. a station like Z100 in New York or KIS in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, they're not playing a wide spectrum of music. They're playing, you know, the, you know, the pop hits um, and, and some hip hop, and maybe some kind of pop, poppy rock, but it, you're not getting much of a spectrum. You mm. know, they, they don't even they don't, they don't even play hardcore hip hop. You know, let alone any kind of of real you know alternative rock. So really, the people that you know, the kids that listen to though you know to CHR. Again, they're only getting a very limited uh, spectrum of what of the music that's currently of currently available. That's why it's uh, you know I think that's why a lot of a lot of young people just are not aware of other you know other musical genres, and they're certainly not aware of you know of the history. Whereas there are kids that grow up and are you know, fed classic rock almost from the time they're in the womb and mm. grow up loving classic rock music. Right. Because, because they're exposed to it. But if, a, mm -hmm. but a kid, you know, a kid who only listens to hip hop or top Ford or CHR, uh, you know, they're not, they're not getting that, that wide a, a spectrum. And that's probably why, You've got people who, young people who have never heard of Paul McCartney. Well, Can I, make I, I gotta tell you. Okay, so the Beatles, as a, a group, uh, forgetting about the solo stuff, were big from 1964 to 70 here. Um, and I think that while we're in some ways lamenting that um, that young people, you know, sometimes don't know the stuff, the fact is, for them to know it as well as they do for there to be such a huge audience among young people for the Beatles, which I think there is, even if a mm -hmm. lot of people don't Absolutely. know who they are. I think it's kind of extraordinary because the equivalent would be for us as kids in 1964 to 70 to have been really familiar with the pop music of 1914 to 1920. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was 50 years earlier. And I'm, I'm right. pretty sure that, you know, we, we may know that stuff now because we're older and we've, we've been curious and gone back and looked at things. But we didn't know that mm -hmm. as a kid, you know, that, oh, that yeah. I don't think any of us could have named a single star from from that period. And yet a lot of young people do know the Beatles. So um, while it's in some ways lamentable that they don't know them better because it's such great stuff, um, it's kind of remarkable that they know them as well as they do. Yeah, mm, that's very that's true. Because, uh, because I, I, you know, I know that in my case, I was not aware of what towering figures in the history of popular music, Louis Armstrong and Bing Crosby uh, were until decades later. You know, I'll, uh, probably maybe the eighties and nineties. When I, you know, really became right. aware of their, you know, of, of just how huge, you know, their their importance is in the the development of popular music during the first half of the twentieth century. Mm. But yeah. even as a little kid, I was always exposed to big band stuff through my parents, and mm -hmm. I didn't know the 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 historical significance of the music, but I knew the music, and I sure. knew names like Glenn Miller. You know, mm -hmm. and Tommy Dorsey and people like that. They were completely sure. familiar to me. Sure. But um, it's, it's still fascinating to me. See, it, what, what shocks me here is not whether or not a young person knows or doesn't know Paul McCartney's music, but they certainly should know the name. 
that's a completely different issue. And, mm-hmm. and I, it's hard for me to, to even imagine a young kid because of Paul's, you know, presence for the last 50 plus years in music, whether it's Beatles, whether it's solo, even the fact that th- there's hardly a week that goes by when I look on the Internet and Paul isn't making news for something. <laughs> you know, his name is always out right. there. So it's that that surprises me. Not tell whether me, or not they know Paul's music. <laughs> you know better than all of us, so. Yeah. Steve. But, uh, no, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, you know, from my own personal point of view, I mean, I got to know uh, Lawrence Welk and things like that when I was a kid. Not that I really yeah. liked it. But there's a, you know, there's a difference between the music of, you know, that era and the music of the 60s versus now, because... I think kids, you know, it's it, a lot of the music of the '60s is not looked, you know, not looked as old or as old, if if I can if I can say that right. I think you were talking, Ken. You were talking, you know, how hard it is to to get advertisers for a show with the Beatles. I don't think that that I think there's a big difference between now versus then. If you if you if you get what I'm saying, there's a big difference. I think kids are a lot more accepting uh, of the Beatles now than we were of accepting things like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, you know, back in the 60s. Uh, you're more likely to see a kid with a Beatles shirt today than you would have been to see a kid with a, well, they didn't have really Dean Martin shirts back then. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, being a fan of something like that, that just wouldn't happen, would have happened back then. So. See, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And we've all been exposed to audiences, whether we're at the Fest for Beatle fans or sure. going to a Paul show or a Ringo mm-hmm. show. And you've sure. got teenagers there and you've got people in their 20s. But people in my industry, and, you know, we've talked about this probably on the show here, but the, this industry is based on the premise that when an artist comes out initially and makes their impact for whatever concentrated period of time that is, their core audience for the rest of their careers is that first audience. Mm, And I totally disagree with that. You Mm -hmm. know, so for example, when I went and approached my show to a syndicator, the the person who was in charge of programming said to me, well, we're going after the baby boomers. And I didn't want to get into a big argument with him. I barely know this person. I want to have a good first impression that I make on him. But, you know, why do they automatically think it's the baby boomers that we're attracting. The Beatles have attracted new audiences in every decade since the 60s. Sure. And that doesn't seem to matter. That's how people in my industry think. And that's why, you know, we've talked about just a little bit here, uh, especially you, Al. If you mm-hmm. follow oldies radio or what they now call classic hits radio, they're removing right. 60s music because... The feeling mm-hmm. is that the people who care about that are people who grew up in that time and they're in their 50s or mid 50s and older and they don't want to attract that demographic. Right. But we know better when we see all these audiences and it's not just the Beatles. You were just it was very um, uh, I, I really agree with what you were saying about the classic rock audience because I've seen many cl- uh, classic rock artists in concert and. Parents are bringing their kids to see them. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I saw I saw Lou, Lou Graham recently, and there are kids in the audience there who weren't even born when Foreigner was around. So mm-hmm. that happens all the time. But people in my industry don't think that way. That's not how music is programmed in our culture on radio stations, and that's why we're seeing the gradual withering away of '60s music on oldies radio and even classic rock radio. There's a lot of classic rock stations, and for a long time it's been like this, that will only play late 60s music, and you're lucky if you get that now. I mean, you might have a Beatles special on the weekend, but that's just one select time. As far as Mm -hmm. the regular diet of what gets played, you don't hear it that much. Mm -hmm. But somehow, young people are are finding the Beatles somehow. So, um, you know, that's, that's so fascinating right there. But... This, this whole idea, and, and there were articles that I saw online that, that pretty much indicated that we shouldn't expect young people today to know who the Beatles were. It was 50 years ago, and that's, there's a mentality of that out there. And if you're trying to get advertisers, and people who are advertisers only think 60s, it's 50 years ago, mm-hmm. and you know, 
it's a long time ago <laughs> already. Yes, it, and yes, do you think that if you if you think that most of the audience there is is that age, fifties and up, then you're not going to attract, you know, them as as potential sponsors. So there's what we observe and we know better. <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's this other world out there of how people in our industry think. And, and even the two of you, well, actually all three of you, have expressed this to me about the print world and how they don't yes. really care about veteran artists because you're going to be attracting older people by doing so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is Go a on. funny thing because obviously they're, they're, they want to attract advertisers. Um, and those of us old, over 50 have actual money. I mean, it it simply doesn't make sense. Even forgetting about the artistic issues involved, it simply doesn't make any commercial sense to take that point of view. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. But don't get me started. (laughs) But you know something? Even to drive this point home further, um, when Steve and I were doing the show together and you guys weren't a part of it yet, I know that, Al, you were trying to chime in on the show that we did Mm -hmm. on the CBS special on the Beatles last year and how we were talking about how it was mainly new artists with a few veterans. Well, there's a reason for that. (laughs) And that's because the network wants to attract younger people. Exactly. Everything is youth driven in our culture. Mm -hmm. And if the perception is that these older artists will only attract older people, then that's why, you know, there is this big difference and this big generation gap. That's how I see it anyway. Yeah, but, very, um, very much so. Uh, let me let me ask about something else connected with the 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 Kanye West uh, situation. Following up on all of the "Who's this guy?" Paul McCartney uh, tweets, uh, there also seemed to be a lot of reaction on, especially on in places like Facebook, from you know the say the McCartney fandom that was mm. very very hostile. I mean, there were there were people that I uh, I saw comments from that wouldn't even they wouldn't even listen to the song because right. of the the presence of Kanye West, and it's it, and it's interesting because there seems to be almost uh, in a in a way uh, both a kind of a, a sense of musical racism and even cultural racism uh, at work here. Because it's it's interesting that um, these people will you know won't even wouldn't even listen to the song, but they have had no problem at all with the fact that for two or three years, Paul has been working on a almost like a semi regular basis with Dave Grohl, mm. and yet these are maybe people that may not really have liked Nirvana or may not be fans of Foo Fighters. And yet they don't seem to have any, they don't seem to have the problem with Paul working with a Dave Grohl that they obviously have with him working with Kanye West. But Dave Grohl is, is essentially a classic rocker with, yeah. uh, you know, newer mm-hmm. instrument, but you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, he's not, he's not a million miles away from Paul as, yeah. Kanye West in his normal state, let's say, is. Um, right. And I think that it, it's a pity that they're not listening to the song because if they think they're, they're not going to listen to it because they don't like hip hop, it isn't hip hop. You know, right. I mean, they, they I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't understand people who will refuse to listen to something on principle. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, maybe that's me. I mean, I'll, I'll listen to anything. You know, I might hate it, but I'll listen to it. You know? mm-hmm. and and why isn't everybody like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, That's, if, if, if you, you love music, and I would assume that all the people who listen to this show love music, um, you know, why would you not? It, it's not even a very long song. It's not like, you know, no. Life with the Lions. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did it. He's you gonna, did it. <laughs> he's going to work that album into every it. show. Yeah. That's right. One but of these days, you're going to be surprised like, to find that yeah, Life with the Lions is going to be a high-charting album very soon because of your constant <laughs> mentions of it. Right. It could be. <laughs> well, either that or, or Yoko will remaster it, and uh, then we'll, you know, then we'll have to deal with it seriously. 
there's um there's so many things I, I, I want to say on this subject because to me a lot of Beatle fans that one of the, the things I love, one of the many things I loved about the Beatles was they were the symbols of change. You know, yeah. they constantly kept changing as a band. They ca- constantly kept on growing. They were always experimenting, and that went into their solo music, too. But there are a lot of fans out there that pretty much only like the pop rock and not much else. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of fans didn't like the fact that they broke up. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. that was too big of a change for them. And it's just like when John teamed up with Yoko and, and they did their avant-garde thing. And a lot of people couldn't relate to that. I'm not saying that we have to look at everything that all four of them have done as being wonderful and we must all accept it. But a lot of people wouldn't even give it a chance, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's if you admire the Beatles so much because they are, you know, the, the harbingers of, of change, then why don't you embrace change? <laughs> You know, and I'm not saying you have to mm-hmm. love the song with Kanye West, but at least admire the fact that he's trying to do something that's a little bit different and work with different people. Mm-hmm. I mean, if anything, you get stale as an artist if you keep working with the same people over and over and over again. And I, that's how I truly feel. So if you work with a lot of different artists, then you then you grow. And I love and- all the different collaborations that Paul's done, like like um, Alan was saying, Elvis Costello, Eric Stewart, people like that. You know, I, I embrace all that stuff. It doesn't mean you have to love everything that they do, but at least you should, you know, be a little bit, you know, respectful of the fact that that Paul's trying to do something different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's you know, for instance, uh, in that same, in that sort of that same vein, the song that Paul uh, recorded with the surviving members of Nirvana a couple of years ago, "Cut Me Some Slack," is uh-huh. probably is about as far removed from what you would call you know the the core Paul McCartney sound, if you if there is such a thing, as you know as you could as you could imagine, and yet again people didn't really seem to have too much of a problem with that. I don't think that was you that know, big a, a difference between that and Helter Skelter, or or yeah. um, something like Monkberry Moon Delight, where he's got those screaming vocals. I don't think that was or or the first track on Electric Arguments. Um, you know, the, there are songs that are like that that Paul's done in his career. It wasn't nothing new to me, but it's not your typical Paul song, mm-hmm. but he's done it before. Right. I think I think maybe what people liked about his collaboration with Dave Grohl and Nirvana uh, as such um, was that a lot of people who really like Paul's work lament quite often that he sometimes does too much of the soft-edged Paul McCartney and not enough of the hard-edged Paul McCartney, and that Mm -hmm. this was giving him or pushing him towards some of that hard edge, while the people who don't like the Kanye collaboration see it as kind of, in a way, pandering, I suppose, you know, like jumping onto the latest trend. I I, I mean, that Mm -hmm. could be... I'm not a mind reader, but I'm guessing that maybe that why some people had less problem with Dave Grohl than than with this, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Paul's done stuff like that over the years. I mean, you know, look, he, he had a little disco period, you know, with Good Night Tonight and, and Coming Up even, you know, that was a lot of people didn't like those songs because they seemed to be taking that kind of disco sound and putting it into his sound in a way that seemed at the time, I think, a little detrimental and yet you know, coming up, survived in his stage set for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, there's and, always and... that argument of whether or not Paul is um, starting a musical trend or just reflecting one. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you tend to admire artists who are the innovators instead of people who are just reflecting what's going on at the time. Although, look, what were the Beatles doing also in the 60s? You know, they sure. were taking mm-hmm. ideas from a lot of artists at that time. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Good Day Sunshine, to a great extent, came from The Love and Spoonful. Obviously, Here, There, and Everywhere, by Paul's own admission, was, you know, influenced by The Beach Boys' God Only Knows, uh, and on and on. Plus, of course, the the, the the towering influence of Dylan at that point. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. They were, you know, they were conduits mm-hmm. for, you know, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different music. And in fact, of course, at the very beginning, they were conduits for a lot of the, you know, classic 
uh, American rock and roll and R and B that a lot of us <laughs> were too young to have experienced. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so really, you know, really they've been certainly in Paul's case, for his whole career, he's been kind of a musical conduit of different of different genres. I could see him being influenced by so many people. And yeah. I hear it in his music. So, and sure. there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> oh no, not a, not a, not in the least, not in the least. But I get, but I think Alan Alan makes a good point because I think possibly, obviously, Kanye West does not have uh, a high favorability uh, quotient with uh, a lot of uh, kind of like the mainstream audience, especially the older ones. I mean, hey, the president of the United States called him a jackass. <laughs> so <laughs> that has to count for something. And, but but I think you know and I think probably a lot of people just think of him as uh you know just a you know a, the typical celeb 21st century celebrity with the you know the celebrity the celebrity wife who is famous for being famous or whatever. Uh, you know that that mm-hmm. kind of thing, and so I think mm-hmm. uh, I think people kind of look at him with a a jaundiced eye, and that and also there's be. that that feeling of today's artists, most of them are are like flash in the pans that they'll have five minutes of fame, and so why is Paul associating himself with someone who actually has had who's been around for I was going to say now. He, yeah he's been he's been around for better than a decade because I can remember. Back when I was when I was at ASCAP, and that was you know almost a decade ago, uh, and he uh, appeared at um, I think it was one of the years that the MTV Video Music Awards was held uh, at uh, at Lincoln Center, and I can remember seeing uh, some of the younger people in our office. You know, clamoring at the windows because our windows were right across from Lincoln Center uh, to get a glimpse of him as he arrived, and that was mm. you know 2004, 2005, somewhere in that neighborhood. So he's right. so so he's had a you know a in terms of a, a a lifespan, he's had a fairly spacious career. Right, but there is that attitude out there that some of Paul's fans have that he's not worthy mm-hmm. of working with Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and we can uh, certainly all much. list so many people that we'd love to see Paul work with that he's mm-hmm. never worked with or has only worked with a little bit. So, mm-hmm. you know, I can certainly understand that point of view, too. Sure. So why don't we why don't we just bring up the whole idea of, of Paul, the Beatles and their relevance today? Because when you see these quotes online about who is Paul McCartney and there are those articles like I was mentioning before, people actually saying that we shouldn't expect young people today to know the artists of the past. Do mm-hmm. you think that the Beatles are as relevant today as they've always been? Um, especially when you consider the way that they're treated in the media, um, like we have just been talking about. And I know that, Alan, you were just saying to me a, a few weeks ago about how at the New York Times they didn't want to cover the Beatles for some reason, even though they were, it was, I guess it was for the 50th anniversary, but, you know, not long right. after that. Yeah, I mean, just like that, just drop the Beatles quickly right after that. Mm-hmm. You know, they just don't seem to have the respect, to me anyway, uh, in the media, because it's so driven towards the youth. I think that's true uh, in a lot more places than newspapers. I think in general, you know, young people get the upper hand. Uh, I mean, look at all the, you know, if you go online and look at the... Uh, you know, uh, any newspaper, any entertainment website, they're not talking about the Beatles very as much as they're talking about Taylor Swift and, you know, people, uh, Madonna, even Madonna, who's who's really, you know, kind of uh, uh, getting up there in age now in terms of, you mm. know, uh, her viability uh, or, you know i mean she's she's not a young she's not a young person anymore she's no spring chicken but she's still getting a lot of press and and uh, this whole thing about the her tracks leaked online is getting a lot of uh, is getting a lot of buzz whereas the beatles haven't done you know if the beatles were to do something like that maybe it would get some kind of buzz but you know they 
play it pretty close to the vest and they p- play it pretty traditional and and that just doesn't happen. Well, of course, the you know there's the, the let's face it, there's the factor that you know the Beatles as such don't exist anymore. You know, uh, let's face it. I mean, yes, two of them are still alive, but um, the, you know the you know there never will be a Beatles concert ever again. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, but. On the other hand, then there is still the success, dare I bring it up again, of one, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in this in this uh, century, you know. So obviously there's, uh, you know, there is, there is an audience out there, you know, but the... Well, how do you uh, measure, mm-hmm. how do you measure relevance then? What is it in your opinion that makes the Beatles still relevant? It, um, hmm. Boy, that, that's an interesting, it's a good question. I mean, between the four of us, there's no argument that we think that they were the greatest band of all time. And we can scream it to the heavens. We can scream it all we want. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the world thinks the same way that we do. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can say, as I've said before, there are more Beatles tribute bands than there ever been before. When Paul or Ringo tour, they sell out everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. Um, The Fest for Beatles fans is still doing extremely well. Whenever the Beatles release anything, even that the um, the iTunes release of late last year, you know, it's still made number one on iTunes. They still make waves whenever a new release comes out. They still get a lot of attention, if only for mm-hmm. a brief time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you gauge whether or not they're relevant? You know, is it all based on looking at the charts right now and how well... Uh, a new Beatles album, whatever it may be, the 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 box mm-hmm. set of the Capitol albums, whatever it is, mm-hmm. uh, the mono box. Do you just gauge everything by that, or is it more to do with how artists of today, if they're influenced by them, is that the biggest way that you look at their relevance today? I think it's more their history and their legacy than anything else. I mean, you're not going to get that kind of respect for, uh, you know, dare I say it for groups like the Dave Clark Five who, you know, did great work in the 60s, but they're not going to get the, even though, you know, uh, PBS did that big thing with them last year and put out the um, the DVD, Dave Clark Five don't get the respect that the Beatles do. Part of that actually is the Dave Clark, is, you know, Dave Clark's fault. But but the, the Beatles, ha- you know, get a lot, get the most respect because they deserve to get the most respect. They, you know, they they ruled the charts, you know, in in the 60s uh, for a good reason. And not because they, you know, not because they, uh, you know, followed trends or anything. They were their own, they did their own thing and they led the way and people, and people loved them and they still have a lot of, they still get a lot of respect. So I think that's, I think that answers that question. Um, you know, the Stones, to a certain respect, uh, you know, to a certain uh uh, respect get that kind of uh, attention too, but I think the Beatles are in a class by themselves. And I'm not saying that because, I mean, I write them and cause, uh, write about them, and because I'm a big fan. I mean, because I mean, uh, uh, you know, that sounds like I'm a little prejudiced. But no, seriously though, you know, from a impartial standpoint, they get respect unlike any other musical artist in the last 50 years. Well, for instance, we have a man here whose primary beat is music of composers who have been, in some cases, have been dead for hundreds of years. Who would and that be? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, many of them are so, still alive. <laughs> right, right, so, right. But, uh, but the, you know, the, the big ones that are, right. you know, I know no what you're longer. saying. In fact, yeah. I mean, I I actually was thinking about that as as you guys were talking about this, Mm -hmm. Um, because I think the whole question of relevance is irrelevant. What do we mean when we're talking about relevance? Are we we're talking about it's at a certain point we were talking about they're relevant because they sell a lot. That to me is a completely uninteresting consideration for music making. They're relevant because they influence people. Okay, there's that. But hey, the Beatles. influence a lot of people um you know even even i would imagine people who 
don't know that it's the Beatles. They're being influenced by, you know, what they what they put out there is so much in the DNA of pop music that exactly. it would be. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, what's relevant is a piece of music. And we could be talking about a piece of medieval music or Monteverdi mm-hmm. or Bach or Beethoven or someone writing today for contemporary classical ensembles or rock or jazz, a piece of music that kind of reaches out and grabs you and says something to you and does something to you is relevant, no matter what it is, you know? So, so the question of whether the Beatles are relevant or not to me hangs on that question. Does the stuff they do reach out and grab you? And I think for probably most of the people, people listening right. to this podcast, the Beatles are, are very relevant. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they, otherwise like ask, the, the whole relevance question is, yeah. Go ahead. It's like asking if, you know, if Mozart is still relevant. Right. And people you know. do ask that, you know, I mean, we yeah. hear all the time, those of us in the classical music world, well, it's not relevant. What does that mean? Relevant I to what? Know. Right. You know? <laughs> so, Yeah. Well, I just bring it up only because of this mm. this whole incident of what occurred through this Kanye West McCartney collaboration and what what uh, what we saw on the internet, and just the fact that a lot of young right. people yeah, I was, I was, don't know Paul's I music. Wasn't criticizing you know, the question, right? I wasn't criticizing the question. I was just you know commenting on the concept. Well, I, I think it's really important for us to discuss, and I really, in some ways, think it may be the most important thing that we discuss. You know, how relevant mm-hmm. the Beatles still are, you know, and, and how do you gauge re- relevance? And uh, for different people, it's different answers. And you just gave a great answer, Alan. You know, but when well, when there's you. a lot of young people out there that don't know who Paul is, which is still hard for me to believe, mm-hmm. then it makes me question mm-hmm. that. You know, there's so many ways that artists can have an impact. And yes, I, I agree with what you said about the Beatles being in the DNA of a lot of artists of today. But you have to recognize that in order for, for people to, to really take notice of that. You know, I hear Beatles influence in some of today's artists, but that doesn't mean mm. young people who are listening realize it. <laughs> so, right, that's uh, true. you know, all, all that's, uh, you know, very important to discuss. And that's sure. part of why we're doing this. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, well, that's it's kind of like with, uh, with us when we were first listening to Beatles music in 1964 and 65 and hearing them either doing covers or talking about the influence of Elvis or particularly Buddy Holly, you know, who were artists that, you know, were, we were really too young to be all that involved with. And so in a lot of cases, uh, you know, certainly in my case, I, I went out that first summer of 64 and bought the first Elvis's Gold Records album and one of those Buddy Holly Greatest Hits albums. And I've been a fan ever since. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, but a lot of, you know, you know, at, at that point, a lot of us, especially since at that point, Buddy had been dead for five years. Uh, a lot of us were probably only vaguely aware of who he was. And then as you listen to these early influences, you hear their influence in the Beatles music. And I'm not just talking exactly. about not just the covers. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's all pretty fascinating. And it's just sure. like, um, you know, every time that you discover more about their influences, like I remember when Kisses on the Bottom came out and Paul was talking about a few songs that John in particular liked mm-hmm. from, I think, the 1930s. Well, what did I do? I went to YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at these songs and I tried to to hear something in those songs that maybe influenced John or I could hear mm-hmm. it in in some song that maybe he created. But uh all this is really important when we're talking about the Beatles here to understand their whole growth and development and uh and it even it concerns what's going on today with Paul. So, anybody like to add anything? No. <laughs> uh, I think I think we pretty well I think we pretty well covered it uh you know. So I get actually what the one thing we should go back to what Alan was saying earlier that, you know, anybody who who would dismiss this out of hand without listening to it is not really being fair to themselves and to, you know, mm-hmm. and, to, and, and to Paul. And I think that's a that's a really good point. Um, I mean, even if you don't have to like it 
and and I'm going to be honest, I'm not a big fan. I, you know, the song doesn't bowl me over a lot, but when you consider Paul's contribution and Paul is there, I think, you know, that, you know, that needs to be absorbed. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It'd be really interesting if, if you can sense an influence that Paul's having in Kanye's music or vice versa. And, uh, you know, that, that could be an interesting thing. You know, I like when, when, uh, there are these collaborations and you don't know how much one guy's contributing, but, you know, in, in some ways, one of them can influence the other one's song and vice versa. So mm-hmm. I like to see when that happens. It's happened many times with Paul's uh, solo music. Right. So with that, if any of you would like to get in touch with us, we do have an email address, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook page for Things We Said Today. If you would like to get in touch with Steve, he's got a million Facebook pages. Why don't you just name, a, <laughs> why don't you name just a couple of them? Uh, my personal Facebook page, uh, the Beatles Examiner page, and the uh, Beatles News and Commentary page, where I post all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And you can reach me at every little thing at att.net. That's my email address. I also have my own website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And uh, I do want to take this time to thank Matt Burley. We don't thank him enough because he carries this show on Fab Four Radio, which you can hear Saturdays at 12 noon. And also Sundays at 12 noon and 12 midnight, that's all Eastern Standard Time. And Sunday, by the way, you can hear Every Little Thing, my other show, right before Things We Said Today. So uh, I get a double bill there, Sunday nights, (laughs) starting at 11 o'clock. All right, so thanks so much. (laughs) (laughs) It's my favorite topic, though. Anyway, so... (laughs) For Things We Said Today, I'm Ken Michaels, being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen, thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you all next time. <laughs> <laughs>